Hebrews. We're in chapter 4 this morning, so open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 4. Follow along with me, not not audibly, but just follow along in in your Bibles there as I read chapter 4, verses 1 to 13. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the good news proclaimed to us, just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them, because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Speaking of the Israelites here, that wilderness generation. Now we who have believed enter that rest, just as God has said. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his works have been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. On the seventh day God rested from all his works. And again in the passage above he says, They shall never enter my rest. Therefore, since it still remains for some to enter that rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience, God again set a certain day, calling it today. This he did when a long time later he spoke through David, as in the passage already quoted. Psalm 95 here. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. The theme for our, our, our message today is the way forward by striving to enter God's rest. That's what we've entitled this sermon. We're getting that from verse 11. Some translations have it there. The NIV has the word, make every effort. But some translations have their strive after. That idea is one that is going after something with intense effort and motivation. Yesterday, T and I were... Uh, had the, I got invited to uh, play some pickleball with some, uh, uh, some other folks in the church. And I don't know, some of you probably don't even know what pickleball is. We played it back in, in middle school when I was in uh, PE class. But pickleball is sort of like ping pong on a tennis court. You play with a wiffle ball, not a little ball, a wiffle ball, and you have like a paddle, and you, you kind of go back and forth over the net like you would with tennis. And so we were playing with a couple yesterday. Now, when I was a child, I was, com- I was intensely competitive. I like to think, my parents are here today, they're laughing a little bit. Um, I, I like to think that I've come out of that, and I think I have. I've, I've wrestled hard with not being nearly as competitive as I once was. Um, I still feel the tendency, even on the pickleball court, I've never, I haven't done this in 30 years probably, but you still want to play hard and you want to win, right? But I, I'm, I'm good at pulling that back. I didn't strive after pickleball yesterday, right? Although my body is telling me maybe I strove a little too hard. I'm sore in my legs and my back and everywhere else. But it was, it was fun. It was, it was entertaining. And it's something that I, I could pick up or put down. I, I, I wouldn't necessarily make every effort to make sure I win at that. But in sports, especially in highly competitive sports, when somebody wants to win something, especially at the highest level, they are going to go after it. I'm, all of you know this because I talk about it in illustrations, but I'm a golf fan, and this afternoon there's a, one of the major golf tournaments is in its final round today. And it's uh, a major, so it's one of the big tournaments. If you win one of these tournaments, it really is career-defining for the winner. You want to win a major. And it's, it's a fascinating one because this particular one has uh, one of the competitors is, is Phil Mickelson. He's a fairly famous golfer, and he's in the lead at this point. And Phil Mickelson is 51 years old. That might not sound that old. That's old for a professional golfer. He should be on the senior tour right now, but he's not. He's still playing with the regular young 20-year-olds, and he's leading. And so it would be a big deal if Phil Mickelson would win this afternoon. Needless to say, he will be what? Striving. He will be giving every bit of effort that he has to try to win this particular tournament. 
He would be the oldest person to ever win a major golf tournament. And he wants to do that. And you just know those competitive juices flow. As much intensity as he will go after that, with as well as fellow competitors will, that's kind of getting toward what this command is about. With everything that you can muster to motivate you, go after something. What are we to go after according to this text? Make every effort, strive, anything that can motivate you to enter that rest. Last week, I mentioned at the end of our sermon, we had chapter 3, and uh, the intensity of this warning that is in that text. And I said, don't worry, come back next week. It gets more positive next week. I missed it by a week. It's actually next week that you'll get positive. This week is... The, the passage starts off with fear, a command of fear. That's not super positive, all right? It, that, it wants us to feel some, some uh, pressure as we read this passage. Fear lest you fall short of the goal, as we will see as the rest. And we're continuing in this passage then, this comparison that the author is making between believers in his generation, believers today, and the Exodus generation of Israel. The the command in verse 1 to fear concerns falling short of a goal. Fear the fact that you could fall short. You know, certain goals that we have in life aren't that big of a deal. And we we start off many years with New Year's intentions, right? Resolutions. And we we want to do certain things. We want to bring about changes in our life. And usually within a month, those things go by the wayside. And it's really not that big of a deal to let good intentions slide a little bit. Certain things in life, though, we're going to take a little bit more seriously. I try to motivate, I I still have an instilled fear, but I try to motivate my daughters to make good grades because now that you're in high school and college, this starts mattering towards scholarships and all of those sorts of things. That's a little bit bigger of a deal. But uh, parenting, we talked this morning about these parents up here and what we're calling ourselves to here. Parenting is a bigger deal in life. We don't want to fail at parenting. We don't want to see parents fail in parenting. Why? Because that would be disastrous for these young people down the road. Those are bigger deals. But they're not the ultimate deal. There is even a bigger deal than that. The biggest of all deals, that you, biggest of all goals that you do not want to fall short of is salvation, is life itself. And that's what the author of Hebrews is challenging his readers with, and us today. Fear lest you fall short of this goal to enter into that eternal rest. The main idea of this text is that we must strive to make every effort, all motivation, to enter the rest that God has prepared for us. Why? We're going to look at the why and the how we do this this morning, but first of all, the motivation, the why here, because we can fall short, number one, by hearing and not believing. We can fall short of attaining that goal by hearing, but not believing. In these early verses, this comparison begins again by pointing out what Israel and the church, believers today, have in common. Both Israel and the church have received good news. Israel watched with their very eyes God deliver them from Egypt. They watched as he parted the Red Sea and they walked across on dry land. They heard the voice of God on Mount Sinai as he delivered to Moses his law. They received that law from Moses. They had the direct revelation of God in their life. He announced then as they get into the toward the promised land. He announced that they needed to enter into that promised land and God would go before them and with them and deliver the promised land into their hands. In like manner, these first century believers and us today have received, we have received the good news of Jesus Christ. That Jesus has died to rescue us from our sinful state and if we place our faith in him, that will lead to eternal life. We receive salvation again, not by a ceremony, not by works, not by going to church, not by any of those things. We receive it by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And that's where the comparison between Israel and the church, it's where it gets real. 
What do I mean by that? Only believers can enter into the true rest that God has prepared for his people. For we have had the good news proclaimed to us, and he says now, verse 3, we who have believed enter into that rest. Only believers enter into God's rest. What then does this indicate about belief? Belief isn't simply hearing the gospel. It's not simply sitting in church and listening to the gospel preached to you. That's not belief. Showing up on Sundays to hear the word of God preached. That might be an extension of belief, but it itself isn't belief. Being involved in a religious ceremony as a child, growing up in the church, that's not belief. Belief, according to Hebrews chapter 4 here, is hearing the good news that God has proclaimed and then obeying it. Acting on that good news and doing what God says. You might be sitting here today and say, Phil, that sounds a lot like works righteousness to me. But obedience in this text is that heeding idea. Heeding is listening, it goes into the ear, hearing it, and then doing what is asked, obeying the call of the good news. Jesus spoke of it this way in his own earthly ministry. It is to take up your cross daily and follow me. There's action to that belief or action that comes out of true, genuine belief. We take up our cross daily. We follow Jesus by trusting only in his finished work and then submitting our lives to what he says. This is where Israel failed. Israel failed because they heard the good news, but then they chose not to trust God. And they did not follow where God led them. They took control of their lives. They refused to enter into the land on God's terms, and thus they received the oath from God that swore to them they would never enter his rest. We must strive to enter the rest because we can fall short by hearing but not believing the good news of Jesus Christ. We must strive to enter the rest because secondly, not only can we fall short by hearing and not believing, but because God's creation rest remains open today. This is verses 4 to 9. What is rest in this passage? We'll, we'll get to a definition, but let's follow the logic or trace the logic of what's going here. In relationship to us, humanity, God's rest began at creation when God completed his work of creation. It says this at the end of verse 3, and yet his works have been finished since the creation of the world. And he quotes to back that up, Genesis 2, 2, on the seventh day, God rested from all his works. So in relationship to humanity, rest began at creation when God completed his work of creation and then God entered into his rest. But this rest can't mean that God stopped working. Why? Because God hasn't stopped working. God still works in his creation. We aren't deists, okay? We don't believe God created it all and wound it up and set it in motion and now stands back at a far distance and really has nothing to do with his creation anymore. No, we believe that God works in his creation constantly. He's providentially working and miraculously so today. That's why we pray and ask God to do things because God's at work in his creation. That's why there's people in our church who are going through severe illness right now. What are we doing? We are praying that God would miraculously heal them. That doesn't necessarily mean that God will, because that might not be God's ultimate will. But we do believe and we trust that God can do the miraculous. That's why we request it. God's at work in his creation. He's still at work. So it's a little bit different than completely ceasing from work. We'll get to that in a little bit more. But this is God entering into his rest at creation. Yet for humanity, this rest that God had on offer seems to be something that was lost with the fall. Because Adam's curse includes what in it? Toil. Difficulty. Intense labor. The creation working against him. And ultimately it meant expulsion from the garden. Expulsion from the very presence of God. Israel experienced the same expulsion. 
when they rejected God's good news. They could not enter into the land, that land that God would eventually make his home. And so they were expelled, expelled from, kept out of the very presence of God, God's rest. And yet God still wants to dwell in and amongst his people. This generation missed out on it. So God, according to the author here, set another day called today. That's what he does in this argument out of Psalm 95, the passage that was really the heart of last week's sermon. Psalm 95 speaks of another day called today. And we know that that day has not occurred yet. Why? Because Joshua, the great Jesus figure of the Old Testament, in fact, it's fascinating in Greek here, that G, the word Joshua in Greek is what? It's Jesus. Okay, so it actually says Jesus in the Greek text, but it's referring to Joshua. Joshua couldn't give them rest. I thought Joshua led them into the promised land. Right after that generation died off and the next generation came up, they entered into the land. They received rest, right? Well, in a sense, they conquered the land. God did that. But within a generation or two, they were already falling back into sin. So they didn't fully experience God's rest. And that's why David, when he writes Psalm 95, can speak of today, do not harden your hearts, because there is still a rest available. And that's the conclusion that the author reaches then in verse 9. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Israel never fully entered into it. David spoke about it. The ultimate Jesus, the ultimate Joshua, the ultimate Savior, is the only way to enter into God's rest. That's why today, even today, a Sabbath rest is still available for us to enter into. So what does this mean about Sabbath rest? What does this mean for us? How do we apply this point to our lives today? This Sabbath rest isn't a ceasing from all work. Rather, it is an entering into God's work and participating in life in God's presence, doing life according to God's mission and under God's direction. We submit ourselves to Jesus Christ by obeying Jesus Christ, following his commands over our lives. You see, God's way, God's rest is entered through Christ. And Christ orders our life. And this is where the warning really hits us. We have to watch that we don't become like Israel and rather allow ourselves to order our life, but submit to God's command, obey God's command, if we want to enter into that rest. You see, each of us struggles with pulls in our life and this culture we're swimming in, various things that are competing for Jesus Christ, that are asking us to strive after these things. We have a tendency to strive after success, getting ahead in life, making that bigger dollar figure. We have a desire to go after some of us and strive after attention so that people like us, that we're received well, that we make people happy. Some of us strive after money. Some of us strive after comfort. I just want there to be no tension in my life. Some of us strive after relaxation. Some of us strive after entertainment. And those things compete with Jesus Christ in our life. And the author is hitting us with this reality that we have to strive after one thing and one thing only that can give us ultimate rest, and that is Jesus Christ. All of these other things will leave us empty. I was reading an article this past week that popped up on my homepage on, um, on um, <clears throat> my uh, web browser, and it was a link to William Shatner. William Shatner turned 90 this past week. I don't know. Captain Kirk is now 90. That could make some of you feel pretty old. But the journalist was interviewing Shatner and, and, and just trying to you know, follow up with where he's at in his career and looking back on success in life and all of these sorts of things. And it got down to the end of the article, and the, the journalist wanted to ask one more kind of question and probe into, like, if you had some advice now that you're getting towards the end of your life, but he didn't want to, like, insult William Shatner because maybe he'll live another 10 years. I don't know. 
Um, and so he, he put it this way. He, he said to him, what do you wish you had known at 20 that you now know at 90? Okay, and so he kind of phrased it that way. And here was Shatner's answer. He said, here's an interesting answer. I'm glad I didn't know because what you know at 90 is this. Take it easy. Nothing matters in the end. What goes up must come down. And if I'd known that at 20, I wouldn't have done anything. <laughs> and so looking back on his life, it's like I strove after, or sh sh I was striving after all of the success and that, that gave my life meaning. But I've gotten to the end and I realized there's really nothing there. So if I'd have known that at 20, I probably would have done nothing with my life. There's a lot of truth in what he said if you go after the things that culture, our flesh, this world has on offer for us to strive after. They're empty. And when you get to the end, there's really no lasting meaning there. But is that the goal of humanity? Is that our rest? No, that's why it must be something other than this physical life. It must be something spiritual. It must be something eternal. The author of Hebrews is hammering that thought home that there's something bigger than the physical what you can see here and now. So don't strive after these things. Strive after and hold on to Jesus Christ. I do want to hit on one other aspect of this before we move off applicationally. And that, what does it mean in verse 9 when he says, there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God? What is that? What does it mean that there's this Sabbath rest? And it is brought up here, and it's a really interesting idea. What is, is this mandating that we keep Sabbath today? What does Sabbath mean for us today? My own interpretation of this and the, it gets into relationship of the New Testament to the Old Testament, all of those sorts of things, is that these Old Testament commands around things like Sabbath and other things, while they teach us about God and his ways, they teach us about what he gives to his people and directs his people, they aren't binding on believers today like they were in that Old Covenant era. Let me liken it to this. Let me, let me give you another analogy. I, I treat this in a very similar way to I treat tithing. Tithing is, is not something that's commanded of us in the New Testament. Tithing was an Old Testament, Old Covenant principle for Israel. They tithed on, very, on different things, and they had to give that to God, and it was used for a variety of purposes within the nation. But we get people today that will come up and say, well, how much am I supposed to give to God, right? And 10% and, and tithe makes, a, makes a, a good starting point, I think, as we start talking about how we are going to use our finances and, and give to God. But tithing itself is not commanded. And we were doing a, a study, some of us were doing a study a few months back, um, the Gospel in Life by Tim Keller, and we were also reading a book called Counterfeit, Counterfeit Gods. And, and Keller uses this illustration. He had a, a New York businessman come up to him and on that same concept, and he's like, tithing 10% out of this income, that's a lot of money. Is, am, am I supposed to give that to the church? And Keller's response was, you know, Jesus, if... if if Jesus only gave 10%, what would that have accomplished? Jesus gave what? Everything. He gave his life. And so as we think about that in relationship to what is the call on the believer today, tithing is not something that I give 10% and is that enough? We shouldn't even be thinking in those terms because of the fact that really... God is owed every bit of our money. He owns it all. Because if we're a believer in Jesus Christ, it's his. So I don't give 10%. I, 100% of my finances belong to Jesus Christ. Now I'm going to need to use some of them to live life. I get that. But man, is that a challenge on our lives today or what we are doing, what are we doing with our money? Because the real reality is there's a lot of believers in America that, that God's probably expects that it's a lot more than 10% that we should be giving to him if we're stewarding well and not spending simply on ourselves, on our own idolatry. Now, this passage isn't about tithing, so let's go back to Sabbath. 
I think it's the same principle. And that is we don't look for a one in seven to figure out, okay, I can give God one, and then that means I get the other six. The idea is if we enter into the Sabbath rest, the Sabbath rest that's available to us, every day belongs to Jesus Christ. So every day is done in submission to him, a celebration that I am trusting in Jesus. I am, here's the word, resting in Christ's finished work. So if that is taking place, every day, in a sense, is Sabbath rest for the believer that we can enter into presently. Now, again, I think the tithe, I think Sabbath itself as a principle of how we live that out is a good thing. And I think to put rest into our lives and to recognize that in our lives is a way to demonstrate this, that I don't just work every single day, that I set apart time and solely devote that to God. So while I don't think it's commanded, I think it can be a good thing, and yet at the same time, we don't become pharisaical with it, where all of a sudden you miss the point of it. Your whole life is God's, including every day. And so we live it like that. We live every day resting in God's completed work, accomplished through his son, doing the works of his son. This is why Jesus could work on the Sabbath. Because Jesus is what? Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is about Jesus. Therefore, Jesus could do the miraculous on the Sabbath. It's not a complete cessation of work. It's a resting in God's completed work, his son. Thus, we live every day in God's rest, his presence over our lives. The third reason that we must strive to enter this rest is because entering God's rest involves completing, not simply starting. Verse 10, for anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works just as God did from his. This is a key point that you must hear, I must hear this morning. God's rest occurred after God completed his work. He rested after he did his work. Our work in this life isn't complete until we complete what? This life and enter into his rest, his presence. This is why the rest for God has both a present reality. We can cling to Christ and experience his rest now, but it also is a future eschatological reality for us. It's something that still awaits us that we enter into upon death. Go over with me real quick to Revelation chapter 14. Just flip over a couple pages in your Bible to Revelation chapter 14. John is having a vision, and it's in in the midst of the the challenge that comes out of the beast of the sea and the beast of the earth. And he's seeing the the lamb and the 144,000, and these battle lines are kind of drawn up. And these angels appear And they start announcing to the world to fear God and give him glory. They announce the woe in verse 8 of Babylon the Great and how she has fallen. And all these nations that are mad on the wine of her adulteries. And then verse 9, the third angel follows and says in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in its image, receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured out full strength into the cup of his wrath. He's speaking of the fact here that if we embrace and buy into what this world is selling and we go after that, we are, we are worshiping the beast of this age. And those that do this will experience the wrath of God poured out on them. And notice how he describes that. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the Lamb. And their smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. And there will be no what? Rest day or night for those who worship the beast and its image or for anyone who receives the mark of its name. This calls for patient endurance, a theme that we'll see a lot in Hebrews, on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. The call of this warning is to remain faithful to Christ. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. When do the believers enter into this rest? It's at what? Death. Blessed are the dead who are now at rest in the very presence of God. The point to that is entering rest isn't about starting. 
It's about completing. We don't fully enter the rest until we complete life. Like Israel, we can't witness the works of God, receive His Word, and then turn from it and expect to enter God's rest at the end of our lives. Because the Christian life, the Christian walk, is one of completion, not simply starting. Pilgrim in Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress didn't just participate and start the walk. He had to what? Reach the end, the goal. The Christian life isn't about receiving participation medals. I started it. I'm here, so I get the medal, right? It's about receiving a victor's crown, a wreath that says at the end of this, I have, like Paul says, fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I won the race. No, I kept the faith. I stayed true to Jesus Christ to the very end. Hence, there is laid up for me a crown of life, a crown of righteousness. That's the goal. We enter God's presence, his ultimate rest, at the end of our lives when we cross that line from this life into the next. That's why we have to strive. So how do we strive? This is the why. We see the motivation. But how do we do this, Phil? What is this about? This is the idea. We enter by responding to God's word climactically spoken in the Son. Strive with every effort, verse 11, so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience, for the word of God is alive and active. Now, scholars debate, what is the word of God here? Is this the Bible? Is this Jesus Christ? Yes and yes, yes. Let's just say yes to that. It's all of that. Because the Word is the revelation of God's message for us. And yet we're told in Hebrews 1 that God has spoken to us today. How? In His Son. The message that has come to us is Jesus Christ. The Gospel message. So that this Word, and this is the point of it, this Bible, how do we find out about Jesus? This. Right? Right? This reveals Jesus Christ to us. It tells us who Jesus Christ is, who he was on earth as a human, who he is presently. It tells us what Jesus expects of us. So we go to this because really all of this points to Jesus Christ. He was the embodiment of the word of God, the revelation of God to us. That has huge implications for us because that means that we can't just make Jesus in our image. It's got to be Jesus according to his word. There's many people today who will say, well, I believe in Jesus, but, and then they have all kinds of other things that contradict the revelation of Jesus in his word or what Jesus would expect for us. We have to know the word to know Jesus, to experience Christ in his full truth. But as this word comes into our minds and as we take it in, as we understand Jesus, and as we trust Jesus Christ, and as we believe in him, that word of God proves itself alive and active. Our Savior is risen and his Holy Spirit takes his word and still communicates to us today. So much so that this word is like a sharp, the sharpest of swords piercing into us, dividing us up. I don't think he's making this huge statement about, you know, what is the distinction between the soul and the spirit here. That's not the point. It's that the fact that the sword, the word gets in, and it can just take us apart. Because God sees and God knows everything about us. We're complex creatures, you and I, humans. I have pet, or I have one pet left. We're down to one dog, praise the Lord. And, uh, Bentley's got a mind of his own, but Bentley doesn't have, I, I don't think he has conscience, and I don't think he, he definitely doesn't have the image of God stamped on him. Um, there's, there's things that distinguish us as creatures, but what makes us uniquely human is this, this image of God in us, this conscience, this, this choice, all of these things, that we bear those responsibilities and all that comes with the image of God being in our lives. But every one of us is different, and every one of us has quirks. Every one of us... I, I'm convinced every one of us is weird in a certain way. But we do a great job of masking our weirdness. We cover it up. We don't want people to see it. I don't want you to know about mine. But one of the difficulties of, of, of having teenage daughters is they like to have their friends over a lot. And I've spent 
way too much time in the presence of our youth group now that they've started to know what some of my weirdnesses are. And they give me a very hard time about some of those. I don't like that so much. You're not supposed to know that about me. We hide those things. But what verses 12 and 13 suggest is that God, the Word, through His Word, pierces right into our lives. And one day, we'll ultimately lay bare before His accounting every choice, motivation, action. We will stand before Him and give account because nothing can be hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare to whom we must give account. He sees all and knows all. This is why and how we must enter then into this rest by clinging to Jesus Christ. Notice verse 14. This will be next week. Therefore, based on all of this and how powerful this word is, since we have this great high priest, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess in Jesus Christ. We have to cling on to Jesus Christ because he is God's revealed word and he is our only solution to our fallenness, our frailty, and how far short we fall of God's glory. So how do we strive? We respond here to God's word, and I have three adverbs that we'll close with. The first is this, we respond faithfully. Place your faith in Jesus and hold on to him for dear life. Cling to Christ. What does clinging look like? It means grabbing on to for all your life. We go to, we go to um, Disney World. My, my, my girls are all into Disney, and so we go over there some. And, um, the one ride that I really like over at Hollywood Studios is this ride called the Rock and Roller Coaster. Um, it's in the dark. It's in this building. It's a fairly intense roller coaster, but it's made much more intense by the darkness. And then on top of that, it's a launch roller coaster. You don't go up a hill to get your gravity to come down and get your speed. You get it because they kind of shoot you like out of an air cannon on this roller coaster going forward, and it gets you to about zero to 60 in a matter of like that, all right? And so those first three seconds of that ride are incredibly intense, the best part of the ride, because you feel like when it shoots you that your body's going this way, but your stomach just got left about 200 yards behind you. It really does give you that sensation. And so my approach to that ride is I place my feet forward as firmly as I can, and then I put my head back because I have been stupid enough to lean my head forward at a time. And when you're on a roller coaster and you lean your head forward, any you know, motion sickness, that, that never goes well. And then I put my head back, and then they give you those two handles. My hands grasp very tightly to those handles. I'm guessing in those three seconds, you couldn't pry my hands off. It would be like, you know, is it Eleazar in the Old Testament, right? The son of Dodo who clung to the sword when he fought for David. They couldn't get, they had to pry his fingers off the sword. It was so stuck on there. But we need to cling to Jesus Christ like that. That's faith. I'm not clinging on to other things. I'm not taking Jesus and setting Jesus down and pursuing other things for a while and then coming back to Jesus. No, I cling on to Christ. I believe in him and place my faith completely and solely in him, clinging to him. And he will never let me down. He will never let you down. Now at times, some of you might be sitting here going, Phil, he's let me down. I asked him for this and I didn't get this. Here's the truth. Spiritually, Jesus will never, ever, ever let you down. Now, you might feel let down, but I would suggest if you're feeling let down because you're not getting something from Christ, that that might be the thing that's competing for your worship. Because that's probably saying that I might be clinging to that a little more tightly than I'm clinging to Christ. Because Christ gave his life for you. Cling to him. He will not spiritually disappoint we respond, first of all, faithfully by clinging to Christ, obediently. You can't read this stretch of text and walk away thinking you don't have to obey what it says. Now, there's a lot of us who are uh, disobeying things these days. I don't know about you, but I'm going by these stores now, and they got the sign up that says, you must enter with your mask on. And I'm like, 
Nope. Most of them don't have that rule anymore. They just haven't taken the signs down, right? But if you're vaccinated, it's like, I don't think I have to do that anymore. You know, and so you kind of take or leave some of these commands. Now, that might not be the best testimony. I probably should still put it on, but frustrating. But we treat the Christian life like that sometimes. That I believe in Jesus, but there's certain of these things that really don't apply to me. I can take or leave them, or I can choose not to do this. That's not striving after Jesus Christ. Obedience is critical. Obedience doesn't save, but it is the response, the manifestation of belief, of trust in God's word. God has revealed his salvation and entering into his rest through Jesus. We place our faith in that finished work of Christ, but then we follow Christ. We cling to Christ by submitting to his direction over our lives even in our attitudes and our actions toward his word. We respond obediently, and we must lastly respond corporately. Go back to the exhortations in this text. There's two of them. There's one in verse 1. Therefore, let us be careful. There's the command, not to, unless we fall short. Verse 11, the other one. Let us, therefore, make every effort. Let us strive. Notice these commands, these exhortations, are in the first person plural. Let us the author includes himself in these commands. He doesn't say, let me. He doesn't say, you must. He says, let us. He, he sees these commands as just as important to his own life. And then he gives them corporately to all of us. Striving to enter the rest is a corporate endeavor. Israel, when they entered God's land, had to do it corporately. Joshua and Caleb had great faith. But guess what? They didn't get to enter ahead of the rest of the nation. They couldn't go in to the land with that first generation. It had to be a corporate endeavor. Similarly, we strive as the body of Christ today. We strive together corporately. This implies then that you need to be connected to the body to grow. And I said this last week, and I still, or a couple weeks ago, and I still think it's true. This implies that you need to be connected to the body if you really think and want the assurance that you will enter into the salvation rest of God someday. Because I don't see how it is at all logical from Scripture that you can be a believer in Jesus Christ and reject the body of Jesus Christ. I mean, there might be some that get there that way in the future, but that is not the norm. Further, we need you, the church needs you to help us mature into the complete body so that we can accomplish everything that God wants and intends for Clearwater Community Church. It's this mutual, reciprocal relationship. I used a sports analogy earlier, and I said, you know, that, that um, the Christian life really isn't about getting participation medals, right? Right? was one of the things I hated about youth sports when I was, especially when I was younger, I told you I was highly competitive. And on the teams that I played on, I was usually a starter, I'm almost always a starter, and was halfway decent at the sport. I was never the superstar, but I was a good contributor. And I hated playing sixth grade park and rec basketball, where the rule was every single player on the team must play at least a quarter. We'd get this big lead in the game, right? And then all of a sudden, it'd come to the third quarter, and we got to play the player who's sitting on the bench. It's like, the kid can't tie his shoes, coach. Why are we putting him in the game? And there goes the lead, and it dwindles down, and it's like, ah, oh, it stinks. That's why we like professional sports. The bench player isn't the one who's going to win the, you know, the championship. It's about the superstars, the starters. They take us to the championship. They win the game. And what happens? The rest of the team gets to come along for the ride. They win the championship. But here's the interesting thing about the church. The church isn't really the big leagues. The church is actually the little league. What do I mean by that? Because there's so many people that think of church like the big leagues. That's why we hire you, the professional staff. That's why we have the teachers and the nursery workers. So we can put you guys to work. You do the work. We'll sit. We'll come. We'll be in the church. We'll participate. We'll cheer you on. And that's church for so many people. 
But that's not the picture of the church here. The church here is that everybody has to participate if this is going to fully function in the way that Jesus Christ intends. And so the church is a lot, much, a lot more like the Little League. You have to get involved for your own spiritual growth, but you also have to be connected and involved for the benefit of the body so that we can strive together to complete this task that Jesus Christ has laid before us. So where are you on this journey? Are you clinging to Jesus Christ? You might be sitting here today and you aren't. But this passage wakes you up to the reality that I need a real relationship with Christ. I'm striving after other things or I'm placing my faith in other things. Today can be that day of salvation. Grab on to Christ as the answer for your life. I'd love to talk to you more about that. Josh would, any of us would. Come up to us, ask us. We want you to go out of here knowing you're right with Jesus Christ today. But there's a lot of us today that need to hear this as believers and need to commit, connect, corporately participate in this striving that we are doing. The challenge of this text might be for you to engage afresh with the body of Jesus Christ to let it filter into your life by getting connected into Bible study or a small group or an ABF or whatever so that that body can feed into you and then you can contribute to the health of this church. We must strive to enter the rest that God has prepared for us. Are you striving? And the challenge for us as a church is are we striving together? Josh is going to come and lead us in one last song, but let's close this with a word of prayer this morning. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the challenge of it. Lord, a harsh reality. We don't like these warning passages. But God, it is such a fresh reminder of how we need to make every effort we need to strive after, not the things of this world, but ultimately what you have said through your son, Jesus Christ. That salvation is only available in him. So, Lord, I pray this morning, if there's any that are gathered with us who aren't that, aren't striving after Christ, that today would be that day of salvation where their eyes are open, your spirit convicts them, they place their faith and trust in Christ, and they rest in Him. We don't have to strive after the things of this world. We find our rest in Jesus Christ as we strive after Him. And, Lord, I pray for our church, I pray for all of us today, that we wouldn't be thinking of this as, I'm going to get my participation medal someday because I sit on the sideline here. But that we would enter into the race, into the game. We would strive together, commit our lives through obedience to your word, connection to the body. So that all of us one day, as we together cross that line, can hear, well done, and enter into the rest that you have prepared for us. Lord, we said words this morning of raising children in a context in which that's true. So Lord, help those words not to just ring hollow, but may they be true of our lives and our commitment to Jesus Christ as evidenced in this body. And Lord, may that be on witness this week in our relationships with one another and then in our relationships in this community so that people see there's something different about Clearwater Community Church, that they cling to Jesus Christ. We pray all of this in his name.